Hi, welcome back. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I, a um, long time ago, mentioned to you all that there are, you know, a handful of things you have to be good at uh, to be our kind of painter with the brush. To, you know, skills with the brush. Jocko, way back when, asked me what they were. He, he was trying to get me to come forward with them, and I, for some reason, never got around to it. And I was looking for something to do today, lacking comments and questions that looked like they were appropriate. So I just. Um, um, dug around and here it was, I realized I'd not said anything. So I had a sort of pieced together a, uh, a bunch of points and this has turned into about 20 points of things, sort of skills you need to have. And I'm going to go through them today. I'm going to, I have a handful of pictures. I think uh, our best Boston School guy, this best, best um, uh, example of skill with the brush is, is Joseph DeCamp. <clears throat> And I'm going to use mostly his pictures to be able to talk about the points I'm making. And then, uh, and then uh, why don't we, um, and then we'll look at a couple others uh, as well uh, to make some other points or to follow up with some other points. I'll start with the Velasquez image, uh, but let's just talk about the main points here first. Let's run through them kind of quickly and so you can get the hang of what I'm talking about. Um, so here you are, the key skills, and these are the things that I knew nothing about when I got to Gamel. I studied the Art Students League, as you know, as it were, for for those nearly three years, and not picking up much information, and uh, of this type. So this is all pretty much systematically Gamel Boston School uh, uh, passed down. Uh, so you have to be able to paint wet into wet. The expression is, uh, you uh, if you're not painting wet into wet, you're not painting. You have to learn to do that. You have to learn to paint through, to paint out areas and to bring them back again. You have to be able to paint a wet into wet joint, keeping the colors on either side of it cleaned. Uh, Benson talks about that. Um, you have to be able to paint internal changes uh, without, without having it look clawed on. So you have to have, learn how to make fused color movements um, instead of, you know, a, blotchy ones. With, it's, a, it's a function of making sharp edges and stuff. Uh, yet you have to be able to paint transitions without killing the colors, color transitions, or any kind of transitions, but keeping the color alive. I'll show you many examples of that. You have to create any variety of edges with a stroke. You have to be able to do that any, any, any edge you want, a, a relatively soft edge, a sharp edge, a very sharp edge. And, um, and uh, you have to be um, <clears throat> able to do that with a mark. Now, some people think that I'm trying to say that you're going to draw the entire length of a thing with one stroke. Uh, there's, too, that, there's too much complexity along an edge like that. You don't have to have the skill to do that. We're not looking for that skill. But there's so, but there's so much complexity down the side of a form, uh, down the side of a shape, that you're going to have a, uh, uh, plenty to do uh, managing just sections of that thing. Even though you're thinking big, the sections do exist in their own right. Just like individual color spots do um, in their own right, but the unity is the key thing, right? Hanging together. So um, you have to be able to paint wet on dry joints so they disappear, so they don't show up again later on. That's what I call incorporating a correction, articulating all the content of the look of nature at a spot. Uh, the look of nature, you know, all the content. So if you're talking about a silhouetting spot, you have to have the color value right on both sides of that joint. You have to have the, the value contrast right on both sides of that joint. You have to have the intensity right. You have to have the, if there's a shape there, you have to have the, the shape, anything associated with the angle. You have to have the edge, and so it goes, right? But you've got to, to be able to do that with a stroke, you know, you're going to have to, and, and sometimes you won't get it, so you're going to have to learn to, with a stroke, adjust one portion of that, you know, of those many things. So that's what you got, there's a skill you have to have. You have to be able to, um, move things over. You put, put something down experimentally and you have to move it over and you have to learn to do that efficiently. And, and each time you do it, don't try to live in the past, try to actually make a better statement of it than you did the last, last time. Um, you have to be able to paint a color value movement. That's similar to something I said earlier, transitions. <clears throat> That's very much the transitions idea. You have to be able to paint flat. To paint a uniform wall, for example, so that it, you know, like you were painting a wall of a house, 
Now, you could be flat. That's a values thing. But it could actually have color movements in that where the, where the form stays flat. It could even have value movements in it and still stay flat. But that's not what we mean by flat. There's a kind of flat that has to do with form. And there's the kind of flatness we're talking about is a value a, 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 one that's free of value changes. So you have to create and use broken values. You have to be able to do that. I'll show you those things. Broken values. What does that mean? Like trees, when you're painting trees, you have to be able to, to, to blotch the colors on without drawing a thousand leaves. It's one of those functions of the lay-in. Uh, you have to learn to weave your strokes so that you're not, all your marks aren't going the same way, which is a very unpleasant look. It's a classic um, aesthetic in our kind of painting. And use broken color. Uh, avoid over mixing so you can keep the life in your color. You have to be able to do that with your paint. Um, you have to be able to set a highlight in and, and incorporate it, tie it on. That's all done with the brush. Um, you need to be able to adjust efficiently anything in the painting without repainting an entire area over again. And uh, again, that's the whole idea of incorporate is that idea of making it look like you were never there with that new change. Remember, everything about painting is you make it, you, 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 you lay in a painting and then everything beyond that. And even while you're laying it in, there's this whole adjusting process. The whole, you know, the, the idea and the writers we've mentioned before, the writers say the writing is rewriting. And everything we do is like that, right? And I'm talking about now, but remember now we're talking about impressionist painting. That is painting, painting what you see in front of you with the intention of making a likeness of that. Um, you need to learn how to use the palette, to, and so that's with the brush. I mean, you need to have, go down to the palette and mix the color that you're going to need to adjust the color up there. That's a skill with the brush, would you believe? <laughs> Usually these are about the, with the brain, too. Uh, you need to be able to draw with the, you know, the, uh, draw, so draw with the darker pigment. You draw with the darks. That's a mentality. You also have to have skills of drawing with the lights when you need to. And, uh, and what... Without, without, as we went said way earlier on, without making a dirty mess down in a spot like that, a special skill there. Um, you have to learn to vignette or feather notes. You put down a spot in the very beginning, particularly this happens again and again, and then you need to see how to not. If you put down a spot with a chunk of paint, it'll look like a, an object on the canvas. So one of the things we do is we put down a spot and we feather the edge. So that's just one of the ideas to be able to do that with the brush is a is a is a useful skill. Uh, this is the this is just the various things I think of that I use on a regular basis. So uh, you need to learn how to use the right amount of paint, and then the idea of using solid paint. But the right amount of paint is a very interesting question, uh, and uh, sometimes it has to do with this next point, which is paint without um, paint wet into wet without creating ridges. So that's a skill you have to have. You're using solid paint, but you're you're making two. You're making you're drawing with the darks right through the lights, and you're doing it in a way that you're not building up ridges. That's a skill. So uh, solid paint just means not scumbling around with a dragging paint and stuff like that. By the way, there's nothing about you need to have that's a special skill. It doesn't take as much skill to scumble, to drag paint around and be weak with it in your statement. Uh, it takes more of a skill to use solid paint, put down a stroke, and leave it. The mindset of that. So these are the many things I think about, each which has to do with the paint itself, right? So I'm saying a little more than just what to do with the brush, but it's, you know, it's uh, the pigment in some, in some many ways, though, in every way you're doing something with a brush when you do it. So I'm using, bringing all these things. As I said, it adds up to more. I think it's more like 22 points now, isn't it? I tried to keep this going as a numbers thing, continuous numbers, and there's no reason why this is 1 to 13 here and the other one was 1 to 9 or something. It's just a coincidence. So let's look at these from the beginning. Let's talk about painting wet into wet and things related to that, but while we're looking at a picture or two. You're not going to work with me, are you? Like, here we go. Let's try hitting the laser thing. Here we are. Laser's there. Want anything else there? Yeah. Okay, so painting wet into wet, and that, the, the idea is that you're not painting up to lines like this. And then, you know, so you have a drawing that's finished and you paint this value up to that one and stop. And you paint this one up to that one and stop, right? And on top of that, when you have a um, form, uh, whenever you have, say, the form of the arm, you have to be able to paint that wet into wet. It, 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 you don't want to be making it look like, you know, like, you know, in other words, you want to be able to make, make a nice fluid transition out of that movement. It's a wet into wet thing whenever you have move, value movements, color movements. 
And so you want to be able to paint skillfully this, say, this dark here, that middle tone there, and the gradations into the middle tone and back out of it, you might say, back into the darks. Those are in that class. Uh, I mean, everything has to be painted wet into wet. So you have to be able to articulate an edge. You have to be able to articulate value movements and color movements uh, all in this wet into wet model. Um, it, isn't, it isn't bits of chunks of dry stuff stuck on in the way we, we work. Doesn't mean that, by the way, you can't do it. And landscape actually lends itself to doing that because there's so much textural junk that it, in fact, two or three strokes, fleck, 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 on top of other strokes, as you can see in Monet, does begin, does lend itself to giving you the look of the texture of a tree. By the way, don't, don't say anything I'm saying here. It can't be added to, it can't be uh, improved on, um, and, um, you know, and... Uh, and, and don't be assuming that my list is complete in any way, uh, but I but do have in mind that these things, while many of them apply to everything, they are the, they're fundamental to uh, the Boston School of thinking. The way you would, when you want this articulate drawing, and you want uh, <clears throat> a unified painted surface. This is all the discussion that goes with the Dutch mindset in the Boston School conversation. So you want that you want that. Fully, fully joined surface, everything wet into wet from the one end to the other. Um, so those are the kinds of things that go with our territory. And I'm showing you this Velasquez. I think you can see that's what he's doing. And you'll find that he does that routinely. But I'm really showing you that. Now let's go back to the first to another one of these questions again. So painting wet into wet, painting through, painting in and painting out. So that would have, a, that would have to do with... Um, for example, if you hit this note and you paint it, to paint a beautiful wet edge, you draw with your darks, so you're painting this, you find this gray note, you push it out past where it should be, the sergeant would say a half inch, and then come back uh, and draw with that dark. Make sure you've mixed a beautiful pile of that dark, match the color out of beautifully, and then use that thing and then come back and draw this beautiful edge with it. So that's, you have to be able to paint out and paint in. So we paint out with the lights and come back and draw with the darks. You don't do it the other way. You don't paint your darks. In, don't paint an area out with your darks because it's very, very brutal on you to try to get quality lights back after you've got a filthy area. You change the whole thing into a dark middle. So you can do it with the lights, but you can't do it with the darks. All right. So uh, paint paint a wet into wet joint. Okay. Now the idea of keeping the adjoining colors clean. Um, the um, uh, what you don't want, that, that really has to do with what you don't want is here some dirt along the sleeve, some dirt in the lights right along here that looks that makes it look like you don't know how to draw. You need that to get your fully, fully a, a great quality light effect. You really need to, to have two, and, and this is the way Benson would say it, two flat color values side by side. And when you articulate that, you'll get a way more powerful light effect than if you don't. If you can't do that, so learn to paint this fresh color right up through the, the light, exactly the value you mean for it to be when it gets cut by the dark. That's that story, okay? All right, so then, um, uh, and by the keeping the values clean and the colors clean, by the way, so have that in mind, okay? Paint internal changes free of edges. Now, let's just look at some of those that, were, that are done by... Um, uh, and by the way, sometimes he looks like it. Some of these reproductions you can't tell. It's hard to see from a distance, though, from anything like the right distance. But he's putting down strokes and leaving them. But we're talking about transitions. We're talking about the transitions out here. We're talking about transitions, and more particularly in through here, places like this, or value movements through the forehead, all that sort of stuff. That's where I'm saying what you really want to be able to do is make those things appear to be flowing and not looking chunky. That was one of the problems with the uh, figure work that uh, Monet did is those, the face, I believe it even on that, uh, am I thinking of the right one, on the, um, uh, the woman in a kimono, <clears throat> that, that face looks chunky. And when we painted with Brackman, we would do the same thing. And it was because we had no control of our values. So you'd change colors, but you wouldn't have the brains to actually maintain the value. And that's what, again, like we can talk about that use of the palette. You gotta make sure, if you know what, you put down a value and say, that's the right value, now I need it to become more red, you need to go down to that puddle you made on the palette. As I've talked to you before on use of the palette, and you can look that up. And you need to go down there and match that value right on with the new color that you're going to adjust it with, and then bring it into that thing, and you won't get, 
you won't get that kind of thing. You also don't necessarily have to smooth it around. You can do a little bit of touch, which means uh, fused. There's a fused quality. You need to be able to make a fused quality with your with your paint when you put it on, so it doesn't look like it's been chunked on. That has to do with brush control. Uh, so between those several things, that's a skill. So uh, you need to be able to paint internal changes free of edges. Uh, uh, okay, paint transitions without killing colors, uh, but transitions anywhere. Uh, you're not painting form at the expense of color. So that's another good example, the same picture. What you need is the color transitions and the value transitions at the same time. And you'll see that also in this in this painting here, where you can see all these transitions in through here. You can see color transitions, and you can see value transitions creating form with this backlight here. Okay, so that really is kind of like the crucial skill. If you're at my kind of an impressionist, which wants all the color movement as well as all the value movement, you want great you want great form, but not at the expense of the uh, quality of the light, which is very, very much a function of how, keeping the color alive as well. So, yeah. And let's see. Um, um, yeah, so I mentioned creating any variety of edges with a stroke. And I'm going to talk about that uh, with uh, um, with with the um, camp here, but um, you know what you're seeing here, for example, is a very sharp edge, and then you have another. This this dark here is drawn along a nose, where that's a softer edge, as it were. So there's a middle tone already sitting here, and then your job is to bring in that 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 brush mark, and you'll notice if you've done your basic work in in, in on the cast, you'll understand that that there is a, between the, on the shadow line, there's always a transition, and then there's the great form, the transition between the mass of light, there's all, there's this great form moving, 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 but right before that, whatever that is, hits the edge, you'll find frequently that there's a fused, there's a, there's a diffuse middle tone just for a short distance that has to be right. So that's what I mean by when you're drawing edges. The shadow is where it really, it, it figures more prominent, most prominently. So when you're gonna draw this line down here, you aren't going to simply draw every time you draw a shadow line, draw it sharp. Gemmell seems to have done that. A lot of his work looks like he did that. He didn't, he didn't remain aware of the uh, possibility that the shadow line itself had the look of turn right at its edge. It did not. But many times the shadow line has a look of sharpness. So you want to be able to articulate the relative amount of softness of an edge every time you draw a shape. And that would be true of stuff out here. And we're not drawing fuzzy stuff because it's, you know, that's not our world. We draw the look of nature and the comparative sharpness of this to that as it appeared in nature. Otherwise, you'll lose your space. You'll lose your relationships. So, um, and then the next one was, um, uh, paint wet on dry joints, okay. And I'm gonna skip the next one, but wet on dry joints, uh, moving things over efficiently. Let's try that, wet on dry joints and moving things over efficiently. So, um, if, you're, if you're laying in this painting, this is a start, and um, you, have, you have a problem, say, say this is the second day, and I think this was, this what might've gone on for three days, this start here. This, 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 this is, looks like, it certainly goes on for two. You can find passages where there's wet over wet marks over dry paint, a number of places, and certainly I believe in the back of this arm as much as anywhere. But, um, <clears throat> but you need to be able to, um, you need to be able to paint wet on dry joints, okay. So you need, I'm gonna say something else, I'm gonna say it the other way. You need to be able to move things over efficiently. Here we go. You need to be able to move things over efficiently. So at some point, this arm was too far out. You need to be able to move it over efficiently, right? And if it's the second day, this whole area is going to be dry. If it's the third day, this area, you know, especially if I lay it in on Friday and I don't come back till Monday, this area, whole thing is dry. So I now need to be able to, to mix this color and match it, which is a very important skill, by the way. <laughs> and then I need to be able to remix this color and match it, paint the light out into the dark, and come back and articulate this edge further over where I want it, right? 
But what that's going to leave me with on both sides is a joint right here where the wet, fresh, wet light paint is going to have to join the arm, shall we say, and the fresh dark paint over here is going to have to join this mass of dark. And that joint, which is the right along here somewhere, you're not going to paint this whole thing back out to here and have to draw 10 things, okay? And you're not going to bring this in here and have to draw this over again unless you, until you need to. So what we're trying to say then is that you have to have the skill of, and that's where you can actually use feathering. You, once you get that, you got to get this a dead match. You got to be very good at matching your colors. And to do that, you really have to be painting on the same day in good light. You, especially the neutrals, it's very hard to see them, but you won't see that you're off a little bit. And then it'll show up at the end sometime when you're, when you have the whole thing varnished. Uh, it's what it really, by the way, the second part of that is you really need to make sure your painting remains wet up. And I mean only wet up in the sense of all the color looking fresh. It could be oiled up, it could be uh, retouched varnished, but it has to look like it's full color. And then what you're matching is a real thing that's really there. If you let it go dry and matte on you, you'll be matching something that's different. And it'll be very, first of all, it'll be very hard to match it because of that odd quality that's happening to you. So that's another point. So then you make the wet and wet joint, you'll be doing it on a color that's really like the color that's there. And then your skill at feathering those and tying them on is, is an important one in, with the brush, significantly with the brush. So, um, uh, yeah, and the idea of improving color each time as you do it is a self-evident, right? Uh, but that's just a mark, part of the discussion, not really a brush thing. Okay, so you need to be able to paint a color or value movement. And uh, that's where I just love looking at the, uh, you know, this painting in person. This, this is a value movement, right? But this is a value movement too. This is one expressing form, and this is just expressing light shifts as the window, as the window light diminishes. The light shifts and shifts and shifts, and it will shift in color as well as value. So you need to be good at making your brush do that while maintaining whatever flatness, whatever form the wall has. So uh, this picture makes it look like he's blotchy up here in person. It doesn't look like that even a little. It looks like he's very, very flat. But these kinds of transitions are happening all over the joint, right? All over the joint. Yeah, that's a funny expression for us. Um, so be good at it, you know. Be very, very good at, um, at painting uh, transitions, both of value. Value makes the form and of color. And we're talking about like the shift from, I, I know in one of the pictures, uh, well, you can see a shift from being redder over here uh, to being cooler up here. That's the typical of his studio. <laughs> Oddly, he kept putting women in the position where their faces were actually being lit by, I think, a brick wall across the street. <laughs> and then it would go cooler as it went up. Um, am I thinking of that right? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, it was that downtown Boston, I believe, they were that studio, which I forget the name of, was... Um, was one of those that, uh, I think that was the one that burned. Um, so you need to be able to paint flat, and that's the shadow line discussion. So uh, let's say, so in an area like, like this, that is what we call flat, that area there. You have to be able to, to, do, to do that. Now, if you're in there busy carefully drawing little things that don't count for anything, it's going to be very hard to draw flat. But the idea of flat, that's the word for shadows. And what we mean by that, what, what is produced by that is the sense of atmosphere. So the ability to keep uh, form out of there is a very important skill with a brush. And you have to learn to do it with a brush. You'll have to do it a few times. Uh, sometimes you have to do it a few times in any painting, but, but really that's a fundamental skill that you probably should have learned in cast drawing, how to, how to flatten your shadows. Flat, I like to say flat is the first form, right? So in a sense, in the articulation of paint, you see a lot of styles where people just paint flat, 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 everything's plainer as it were. It's a curious look, not a, not a very fun one. Uh, but then what we want you to do is talk about uh, weaving your strokes, using broken values, uh, learning how to use broken values. I'm gonna save that till last, but let's talk about weaving your strokes. You want broken color that, that uh, we've already talked about uh, broken color because that is a life in the color. And so you have to learn to do that with a brush, but weaving the strokes is a big help, right? So if you have a note there and you're trying to adjust it, every time you put a color note down, instead of trying to slick over and cover the thing, move the brush back and forth in different kinds of ways. Think weaving. Think going this way and this way and this way. Just make sure you don't create, uh, you know, the light will be coming in here and make sure you don't, well, in this case, I should make it look like this. Make sure you don't make the marks go against the light because you're going to get glary ridges. And so what you want to do is figure out how to weave your strokes. 
whatever it is, fused, there would be fused strokes, right? And that's a skill you need. And then you need to be able to put them down alternately as you work without over stir, without stirring them to death, okay? So that's the avoid over mixing portion of this thing. Uh, you need to be able to set and incorporate a highlight. Let's look at something here, um, a real highlight. Um, oh, I, I think that's a pretty okay one right there, that idea right there. And what that requires is, is, is the ability to set down a value and then in, incorporate. So virtually every spot you put down, learn to hit the note of that highlight. But then you'll see as soon as you put it down, it looks like it's got square edges. You've got to figure out what's going to happen to that. Is that going to be, is that going to be joined to the next value by a middle tone? Or how are you going to do that? But that's what you, you have to have a skill at. Every time you put any note down, you have to have a skill of incorporating. And the incorporating part is the part that sort of doesn't stick out. There's a sharp edge along a shadow, along a, a, a line. That's easy to do. But when you're in a thing like this, there's your sharp edge maybe, but then the tying on thing back there, you're doing that with, even with highlights. I wonder if I have a better one to use for that. These guys really go out of their way to avoid highlights. So uh, let's come back to our question. Um, but that's a skill. It's a special kind of skill, learning how to put a highlight in and incorporating it tying it in, which is all to do with with um, f um, with managing the edge of that unit that you want to put in nice and fresh and clean. You want to put in a highlight fresh and clean. Look at it. Again, we'll grab our fingers and stick them in white paint, and it would drag us up to the painting and stick it in like that to show you the highlight. It's a place to begin. All highlights aren't white, but but it's a good place to begin because you can't go any whiter. You know you know whether you're, what your possibilities are uh, in terms of the values of that highlight. So um, how am I doing for time? I think I'm going to get through these without too much more trouble. Um, so adjusting efficiently without repainting, and that's a big kind of a deal, and that's where what you're talking about. No matter what you're painting, let's say you're moving, uh, well, you're just, you could be moving just this edge over, but you've got the thing not looking as round as it should be. You have to be able to not, you don't have to paint this thing over again. you just got to be able to at manage that curve better. And then again, you just need the skill of putting on that paint, having this paint already wet over there, pushing this one into here and drawing with the darks, or if it works better the other way, draw with the lights. You have to be able to draw with lights too. You have to have that as a skill. But it's fundamental that we draw with the darks. So um, some of these, I, I, clearly, even in my mind, I'm starting to duplicate. Um, but the idea isn't to repaint areas over again. I had some students who would do that, and they would be very proud of themselves, like they were really the the epitome of, 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 of good conscience, you know, the good conscience of a painter. You know, just paint it out. Don't try to save your preciouses, you know. But it is much more efficient to correct a passage than to correct a painting. I mean, to correct a whole object. And by the way, when you, I mean, it's just way too much complexity. And besides, we don't even do objects. Once you realize that our world is color masses and what happens where they meet, you realize this little piece is what's wrong. This little color adjustment, it's not an object. It's not, a, it's not the cat that's wrong if you understand what I'm saying. And you'll understand it looking at the rest of the videos. Uh, so draw with the darker pigment. We've talked about that. The vignetting we've talked about. Use the right amount of paint. Use solid paint. Ang said use the right amount of paint. What's the right amount of paint? And then he showed it a guy painting a wall. And I know that from being a wall painter that the right amount of paint is the kind that doesn't, that you don't have to work hard to get on the wall. It covers nicely and easily because the painter doesn't want you putting in your hours, you're much more expensive than the paint <laughs> per hour. So, so the last thing he wants is to have you uh, out working hard. He wants you to work fast and efficiently. But he also only doesn't want you to waste paint. He wants you just to cover it and to cover it well. So that's the idea of the solid paint. The solid paint's a little different actually from that. And that is the solid paint is, the, is that's different from using thinned out paint or scumbling or dragging paint. We can do all those things, but the skill, the real skill, is to use solid paint everywhere you go. And um, but it doesn't. There's no must about it. It's just a. It's just a. It's sort of the standard, a place to begin. Uh, all of our guys and all uh, all impressionists use every strategy, and you know the, that use their what was it? it terrible said I'd use a shovel if you get the effect I wanted. Um, somebody's talking about the brush he was using on a particular day, I think. But somebody else said, I think it was Ennis, he said, I just mud if it'd get the effect I wanted. Um, but paint, paint without uh, creating ridges, that's going to be the crucial thing when you're painting an edge. 
and I'll just um, and I'll just get grab you an edge when you're painting an edge. Let's say on 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 uh, this one. When you're painting an edge, you have a mass here meeting a mass here, and the light's coming this way. You're going to have to stroke this thing this way, right? You're going to have to draw it on that line. If you can avoid ridges along this edge, the day you suddenly realize some of this has to come in, well, when you when you move that thing over, you're not going to have a ridge fighting you and showing a an echo or a glare, you know, uh, off the, with with the light hitting it. So painting flat is really a big deal in that sense. Paint flat, and then when you paint when you paint through, when you paint when you draw with your darks, figure out a way to do it, and that's what the just the right amount of paint does for you, also. Okay. Learn how to do it without creating ridges on those locations. Um, yeah, you can. Um, you just in general avoid ridges. I mean, Gamma would have us go through these things and scrape the painting down at the end of the day if it had ridges, and I just hated that idea so much that I just learned to to make every effort to not paint with ridges. You still look at your painting and you still find that there are days when you wish you had. Sergeant scraping out, you know, that implies ridges when he scrapes out a painting, unless it was just wet, that, then it's implying that he's just getting fresh, getting the paint out of there. But uh, any time in the, in the course of a painting, you may need to scrape an, a ridge, an area down just to get rid of ridges like that when you know you have a shape problem in an area like I just described. So, by the way, I know this is, anybody who's painted much has run into almost all these things, but a lot of times you don't have standards in that sense of, well, we want the surface to be reasonably flat because it's better for the, you can get across your, what you mean to say better than accidents, like accidental ridges when the light's a certain way, it's gonna screw something up. So there are a lot of reasons that this is best practices, um, you know, painting wet into wet and a bunch of other stuff, besides just the uniformity of a surface, which is an elegant thing. Uh, but none of these things, as I said, are things that you, there's no must in it. I mean, when you're an impressionist, the idea is from a distance, the beauty of the general impression from a distance. So, you know, it, it's not where you set that up as much as that you say, there's a standard. There's, there's a, there is a standard, but but there's a higher standard, and that is the beauty of the visual impression is more, is actually on some level, we consider it mostly, we do. M most of us probably have considered it to be more, more important than the surface all by itself. So if you're gonna sacrifice something, you know, consider that thought. But that's up to you to decide in your own, uh, in your own sort of ethic, if you call it your aesthetic ethic. Uh, by the way, that vignetting idea, it shows up here as well. I talked about vignetting, putting down a note and then run it off the edge so it doesn't leave a shape around here. There's all kinds of times when you wanna do that, when you just, just put, put down a stroke, run it off the edge. Uh, uh, so that it doesn't make an event down there, a sharp edge. If you if this light hits that grayer note down there and makes a light effect and starts competing with these light effects, you've got a problem. And that's not at all unusual for that. That can happen. And, uh, and then you're competing with yourself. You're, you're having a bunch of false effects on your canvas that are making your power effects possibly look weak. Not unusual for that to happen. It's not, a, it's not an ideal thing at all. This is an example of broken values. We talk about that, and I want to get through that in the next couple uh, things. Uh, I think there was one other thing to talk about. Let me uh, let me just check that. Um, yeah, how to experiment with paint. Yeah, that's a really good one. So whenever you're doing something, let's say you're going to start like this, and you're not sure if this is in the right place. It feels like it's just wrong. You have to learn to be able to push this hand over into this area successfully and get that look back quickly just to check out an angle that you think might be off a little bit. I, the way we do it, we're always using our eyes for everything. So the interrelations of things visually is, is the key thing. And, and most people just want to somehow measure it and get it right so they can just paint it. But you really find that it's best, best practices says, says get me that effect and let's watch it in its relationships to whatever other things that might be players in that relationship, right? And they're all over the place. So you want to be able to say, you know, that doesn't feel quite right, but I can't see it. I can't, act. it doesn't show itself. I'm not sure I know why. And you always look for other things that might be making it look bad rather than the thing itself. But one needs to experiment. You need to be able to move something over and try it somewhere else just slightly. Uh, but you have to, if you do that, you have to know what your original anchors are. For example, in this painting, if you decided initially that you were going to sit, put the fingers here and the elbow here, where well, you're never going to move those things, but these guys might be adjustable up and down. You might say, I'm going to get the fingers, the finger here and the elbow here. 
and use, oh, say something like this, let's say that we're just below half, you're going to use that for a, for a relationship they're going to keep forever, then everything would be related to that. But you do have to have anchors in your location world. Uh, even in the world of experiments, I mean, you know, you're trying to get this color better. You may have to make sure you know which color you're using as your base, that color there, that whole effect with the beauty of the whole painting sort of derives from that note. Every one of these other notes, whatever you do experimentally, has got to be aware that that one is already a fixed, rather a fixed point. At some point, it's what, making an effort to be the fixed point, and the sooner it is, the better for all the other guys. Again, that's an anchor mentality, but I'm getting into something else now. That's, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I do mean to stay on the subject of... Um, and, and so let's, now let's just talk about uh, the subject of how to use the brush or, or stuff with the brush. You have to be good at uh, In a passage like this, you can see there's a broken, or over here there's a broken values thing, creating a sense of texture. That's what we mean by broken values. That's ten, that tends to be what it does. When you're in this phase of a painting, this is where it particularly applies, then you need to be aware that you have to create that sense of texture for the general impression to be right. But you don't want to get in there and start drawing a thousand little threads. So, because you're trying to get the big impression out there and see that it's working, and then you'll see how many threads you're going to have to draw, so to speak, as you go along. So, let's go over to these, these over here. And I mentioned the texture, a suggestion of value, broken values here, creating the texture of the sense of tree texture, even the shadows. Uh, and here you can see it sort of blatantly, right, all over the place. These are broken values. Look at that, broken values, dark light, dark light, dark light. Now, you would say that he's at some point along the way and through here, he's probably putting his most significant darks in real places that would be the equivalent of drawing. But there's also this idea that you're going to create texture. Even in through here, there's a sense of texture, not, not drawing as much as texture. But this picture isn't truly a start. It's pushed along a bit, but it still, I think, conveys that idea. But I think Venton here may convey it better, and I'll end with this. Uh, as we're getting a little long here. Uh, but I was in the museum looking at this, and I was really impressed when I was in there, having had this discussion very recently with some of my students, with how much texture there is in here, that if you look at it, you wouldn't say it, it is anything. It doesn't resemble anything you would call, um, uh, you know, a reflection of something in particular. Uh, I, mean, I mean, some parts would do that, but, but it just, it was created as a texture. And so it had this broken you can see it's got a textural feeling. It has this broken values thing going on. So that's a thing to have, you want to be good at. It. Can you do that? Can, so when you're trying to adjust this color, you realize it's a little too dark or too light. You adjust the next, use the next color uh, value uh, to adjust it, but you don't don't stir it into a flatness. You want it to become texture. You re this is your opportunity to make a texture over there so it conveys texture as part of the lay-in. And in this case here, this painting doesn't look like it ever needed to be evolved in several places where he's done that. You can see that he's got a marvelous sense of it, the big impression without any going in there and counting leaves, which is one of the beauties of the Impressionist mindset. It's actually much more understandable now that it's about the color play, text, even textural play, uh, or, or edge play, all those sorts of things, intensity, all those. Um, it's much easier to see than it's a matter of counting leaves. This is a stunningly beautiful painting. You'll want, you, you, I don't think you'll ever find a painting with, with leaves counted in here that even begins to resemble the beauty of this thing. Both these are by Vinton, by the way. But look at this little area here. This is a classic case of a texture. Look at these marks just all over the joint. There's no mark. There's no drawing in here in that other sense. But the drawing is a, the creation of texture, and it's a tentative thing. You may do more later, but it's so often, you know, the Boston guys... They, they were down there for the light. They were in there for the magic of the light. And yes, they have a subject like everybody else, but they're not, they don't, that, that doesn't presume that they will then lose the magic of their light effect just to get details. And that's one of those interesting things that we are about. By the way, this is a nice example of textural color chroma value, you know, value movement right across one area, right? Just, just amazing. But look at the broken color all through this thing. And that's just, a, as you'd say, that's just the general impression. Now, people will take that just to be bad drawing. Well, it's, it's not bad drawing. The, what I mean to say is, especially when you get to the Boston School guys, this is extremely articulate right here. This edge here is extremely precise, you know, or this edge. All these things are very much what they're supposed to be, but that's the organizational principle of the Boston School type is to be, str to be strong in your drawing where drawing matters, where drawing needs to be strong. And don't go around doing stuff you don't have to do, or at least don't do it until it's time comes. Don't be drawing minutiae uh, like leaves 
unless they're part of the first impression and, and let's say their silhouette creating a leaf shape is part of that first power impression. All right, but that's a whole, I'm getting way off into this just general stuff. Okay. Well, I hope that begins to, to be it in Jocko, and I hope that it was you who actually asked that question. I'm pretty sure it was way back when. So thank the rest of you for subscribing, for everyone for subscribing, sharing in particular, and, uh, and any comments, please send them in. And let's keep our conversation going in some useful way for you, okay? I really, you know, by the way, I've gotten a number of things where people are mad about things I've said about Bougro. I'm trying to talk about ideas, and uh, yes, it's true. I said, I said, you know, the word demean, <laughs> demean the form, and, and so... I don't mean, I'm not going to run away from that because it's a conceptual thing. And if, it, if you may not understand why I would say that, but it is important though to understand that I'm offering information. And when I say that, it, it's, it's a class of, it, it begins a discussion about information. Now, you don't have to agree with it in the end whether that's true, but try to understand where I'm coming from. I mean, because to understand this, as I said, if you're a, a Bougaro guy, it is to understand Bougaro to understand what Bougro isn't. And that was kind of like the point. When you compare Bougro to the Boston School, there are things in common. They, they get their proportions right. They all try to compose and all that sort of stuff. But there's enough difference that it's very useful, you know, to, to for both of us, for impressionists to understand Bougro and for Bougro lovers, black people to understand, uh, or the ARC types to understand, uh, to understand uh, the impressionist mind, uh, just to be clearer about your mind. All right. Um, all right, I better get out of here. <laughs> this has been 40 minutes. Uh, thank you all, and we'll see you in the next one.